Hello everyone, I'm Samar Razavi and I'm very excited to welcome you to the fifth week of this year Distinguished Lecture Series in Breakthroughs in Water Security. I also like to welcome our simulcast viewers, in particular our students in China in Beijing Normal University. And just as a reminder, there is going to be a question option for anyone who is uh, watching this online in simulcast mode. So all you need to do is to shoot me an email, salmon.razavi at usask.ca, and I'll do my best to ask them on your behalf. And as always, there is a sign-up sheet for our students here. I'd like to thank Jay Familiedi and John Pomeroy for underwriting this seminar series and GIWS Global Institute for Water Security for pro providing uh, logistics and support. This week, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Bridget Stanlon. Bridget is a senior research scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology, Jackson School of Geosciences in the University of Texas at Austin. She received her PhD in geology in 1985 from the University of Kentucky, and after that he worked as a geologist in a consulting company for a couple of years. In 1987, she joined the team at the University of Texas, Austin, as a research scientist, and since then she's been working there. Bridget is a leading scientist on groundwater systems. She's made significant contributions to the field, including uh, uh, contributions to better understanding groundwater recharge and contamination of aquifers and looking at the impact of climate variability and land use change. And of course many of us know her because of her tremendous amount of work on GRACE uh, satellite mission, which is a uh, NASA mission, and uh, we're going to hear a lot more about that in her talk. And of course she's been a member of the GRACE science team for several years. Uh, She's been an active contributor to the International Scientific Committee, uh, providing a range of services and sitting on many different committees. What I'd like to mention here is that she's been serving on editorial boards of a range of journals in different capacities from associate editor, editorship to managing editor. And just to name a few, remote sensing in earth, sci uh, earth system science, environmental research letters, water resources re uh, research, what those zone journal and so on and it's not surprising that because of all her contributions over the years she is one of probably the, the most decorated scientists in hydrology uh, so just to name a few of some of her awards and recognitions i'd like to say she is the recipient of agu hydrologic sciences award in 2018 international association of Hydrogeologist Presidential Award, again in the same year. Uh, she is a member of National Ac Academy of Engineering, which is really the top uh, recognition for someone in our field. American Geophysical Union Fellow, M. King Hubbard Award, Geological Society of Ameri uh, America Fellow, and this list just goes on and on. So it's great pleasure to have Bridget here this week with us. Uh, without any further ado, please welcome me and join in giving her a warm welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate uh, uh, your comments and i um, delighted to have the opportunity to uh, visit uh, um, uh, this university and also uh, to learn about the hydrology in various aspects uh, here. Extremely interesting and a lot of parallels with um, our situation in uh, Texas and in the high plains and with uh, water and uh, irrigated agriculture and oil and gas production and uh, many different things. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, water resources uh, ranging from global to local scales. Um, we hear a lot about global water scarcity and um, uh, issues like that, but I think more recently what I've been hearing, and I think uh, the speaker that you had uh, last week uh, mentioned um, too much, too little, and too hot. And uh, at uh, Global Water Week, uh, the World Bank, uh, the mantra was uh, too much, uh, too little, and uh, too polluted. 
and um, I'm seeing more and more where we have to engineer our way towards more sustainable management, and I think that's a, uh, a good thing for, uh, for engineers and so, um, uh, and promising. Whereas I think sometimes scientists just focus mostly uh, some on the negative aspects of things. I think engineers actually try to um, solve problems, and, uh, and that's really good. And of course, I'm not an engineer, but uh, minor detail. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, um, JFM Yeti spent some time at the University of Texas when uh, I was uh, starting there also and um, um, getting the uh, going on the GRACE uh, satellite uh, mission and so it's uh, great that we have an opportunity to um, continue that effort and Matt Rodell was his student uh, back then. And I would like to acknowledge uh, a lot of people in the work that I'm going to present today which is comparing uh, models with GRACE and uh, uh, it's uh, and I'm sure ma most of you are familiar with the GRACE satellite data, and we'll talk a little bit about that shortly, uh, but it provides an independent data set to evaluate uh, the reliability of models. And um, I acknowledge um, Ashraf uh, Ratab, our postdoc, and uh, Zishan Zhang, a uh, uh, visiting scientist uh, from uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences, and uh, many others from both the GRACE community and uh, the uh, global modeling community and really enjoy working with them and they've been um, very good. So I thought uh, this uh, 60 minutes um, a program that uh, Leslie Stahl uh, put forward uh, uh, a while back was, was extremely interesting. And I think the uh, good aspects of it were that it gave equal voice uh, to remote sensing and to ground-based monitoring. And so uh, a lot of emphasis on the remote sensing. And uh, this is uh, Leslie Stahl and Mike Jackson, or um, Watson, Mike Watson. And um, uh, Claudia Font from the USGS was showing monitoring groundwater levels uh, and things like that. So, so that was nice because oftentimes we get uh, either one or the other. And coming away from AGU uh, a few years ago, water manager said to me, well, with remote sensing and global modeling, I don't need to monitor anything. And that's not the message we want to, to convey. So I really liked uh, this um, 60 minute uh, program. And then uh, Sasha Ritchie, one of Jay's students, uh, um, uh, showing that about a third of uh, global aquifers, groundwater basins were under stress. And uh, GRACE is really nice because it provides a, a global uh, picture and allows us to evaluate many regions. You have to learn a little bit of geography, I think. And I think uh, the emphasis that uh, Jay and his team put on uh, the um, groundwater depletion in California Central Valley had a big impact on uh, policy makers uh, with the uh, uh, going forward with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act uh, that is now underway and um, uh, hopefully leading towards more sustainable management of groundwater in the Central Valley and in California. Um, and then uh, sometimes there's a um, bit of a discord between hydrologists uh, and uh, remote sensing people. And um, I think in some cases, hydrologists want to apply gray satellite data at uh, very small scales and uh, don't acknowledge uh, the coarse resolution of grace. But also, um, I think it just takes uh, some time for the people, uh, uh, different groups to understand each other and to communicate better. And so now we have this Powell working group where the NASA scientists and USGS scientists working together to interpret uh, GRACE data. Um, so this is the outline. I'll talk a little bit about GRACE satellites, and I know m most of you are probably familiar with it uh, because of uh, Jay's presence here, and then a little bit of background on the global models, and uh, then uh, talk about the comparison between the global modeling uh, water storage trends with those from GRACE and then uh, focus in on the uh, Colorado River Basin and what's been going on there. So uh, as most of you know, the GRACE satellites, the uh, original mission uh, was uh, launched in uh, March in 2002. And um, it's, uh, the satellites are about 450 kilometers above the land surface. So it provides a coarse resolution change in water storage from monitoring changes in the Earth's gravity. The primary driver for f variations in Earth's gravity field is movement of water, which uh, Jay mentions is heavy. And um, 
the uh, one of the fortes of the gray satellite data is the large scale um, and so it gives us a big picture of what's happening uh, in at continental to global scales um, but sometimes I feel like uh, you know when you're um, uh, working with your children you always want them to be what they are not you know and so hydrologists often want it to be small scale uh, and um, uh, but I think it's uh, important. Uh, I mean, the large scale is valuable for looking at sea level change and other things. And um, um, so we need to emphasize that. So it measures the changes in total water storage uh, from the atmosphere to the moho. And uh, then if you want to interpret it, then you have to determine how much of that total water storage is happening at the surface water zone, in the soil moisture, or in groundwater. And uh, the new mission was launched uh, this year and very exciting. And uh, uh, I don't know if any of you attended. Did you? Yes. Um, and uh, probably the most exciting thing that happens in hydrology. <laughs> Uh, and so um, really nice uh, to see the continuity and it's one of the few satellites that penetrates deep in the subsurface. Most of the satellites like the soil moisture SMAP uh, satellite only penetrate a very small distance into the subsurface but GRACE uh, by uh, monitoring gravity changes uh, uh, penetrates deeply into the system. Um, so the GRACE data then measure, uh, monitor changes in water storage. So then recently then there's been a lot of emphasis on uh, global models and uh, what they can tell us about water scarcity and other uh, uh, things. So we need models uh, to make uh, projections and uh, many studies have been looking at the, the relative importance of climate change and human intervention using these uh, global models. Um, UNESCO um, uses these in their uh, World Water Assessment Program and um, uh, so if we're going to use these and rely on them heavily, then we need to evaluate uh, the reliability of uh, these uh, models. And uh, this map shows um, uh, groundwater depletion um, based on um, Yoshiwada's uh, analysis of the uh, PCR uh, global hydrologic model. And uh, you can see uh, Northwest India and um, Central Valley in California and other regions um, with um, large scale depletion. So the global models estimate the change in stores by balancing the inputs uh, minus the outputs uh, um, with precipitation being the dominant input or could be also be irrigation return flow and uh, evapotranspiration and runoff and uh, groundwater extraction being the outputs uh, to estimate the change in total water storage. So total water storage, as I mentioned, includes snow, uh, surface reservoirs, uh, soil moisture, and groundwater. So if you want to uh, attribute uh, the changes in total water storage to any one of these components, you need to estimate the other component storages and subtract them from the total water storage. So in many cases, um, total changes in total water storage are attributed to changes in groundwater storage, and so uh, need to estimate all of the other components. And the changes in groundwater storage uh, accumulate the uncertainties that we have in estimating these other components. So global hydrologic models uh, are also called leaky bucket models, and they were originally developed uh, to assess uh, water scarcity, sort of like a water budget approach, a daily water balance. And most of them include uh, human water use, irrigation, and uh, some crude uh, estimates of reservoir management. Um, they include all of the storage components, uh, including snow, surface water, soil moisture, and groundwater. They don't include, uh, they don't use an energy balance, so uh, may not be very accurate in that respect. Uh, the other basic type of global model are land surface models that were uh, developed primarily by the uh, climate community uh, to estimate the low lower boundary condition for their climate models. They are generally uh, more physically based, uh, include energy budget, but they, most of them do not include uh, surface water 
or groundwater storage and uh, our surface water routing mostly one dimensional and most do not include human water use or uh, reservoir management. Uh, so in the um, um, there have been many studies comparing these different models, uh, model intercomparison projects, uh, comparing global hydrologic and land surface models. And a uh, previous study published in PNES suggested that, that these, the uh, variability in these models is similar to what we see in climate models. Uh, however, oftentimes we'll see studies uh, based on a single model and talking about uh, their estimates of sea level rise or something, but if they're that uncertain and as variable as the climate models, we never hear of anybody using a single climate model, so I think maybe we need to consider that. And I think I uh, would like to mention that uh, model intercomparison projects are very interesting, but it's very difficult for us to tell what the causes of the differences among the models. And so I think what Martin Clark is trying to promote with the SUMA um, program and uh, allowing us to interchange different modules from various models may allow us to isolate controls and model dis differences. So what I want to talk about today is how do modeled land water storage trends compare with those from GRACE uh, solutions? And then I uh, will talk a little bit about how we interpret GRACE water storage trends using the Colorado River Basin uh, as a case study. So uh, in our analysis, we used global hydrologic models, the water gap, global hydrologic model, WGHM, and uh, PCR, global water balance. And we did some simulations with and without human intervention. And the land surface models uh, we used were NOAA uh, 2.7, VIC, uh, Mosaic, CLM, and uh, CLSM. We also used a number of different GRACE solutions, but mostly uh, focused on the uh, mass, cons mass CON solutions for the CSR, uh, University of Texas Center for Space Research, and uh, JPL. And uh, we included in the uncertainty estimates the spherical harmonic solutions, uh, both CSR and, um, and JPL. Uh, and we looked at uh, the uh, time series then and decomposed it into long-term trends, uh, seasonal components, interannual, and residual. And today I'm going to focus on the long-term trends in water storage. So we evaluated trends in um, 186 river basins uh, globally. And uh, here you can see the different climate conditions in these uh, various uh, basins. Um, so mostly humid and uh, then arid, uh, semi-arid and arid regions, mostly in Australia. Um, so looking at uh, the um, results of our analysis, so comparing the modeled water storage trends with those from GRACE. So here we show uh, net water storage trends from 2002 through 2014. Um, so uh, this is in cubic kilometers per year. And the blue are where we're seeing increases in water storage. And uh, the red are decreases in water storage. Um, so you can see uh, increases in storage in Amazon and Okavanga Zambezi region. And uh, that's a so an inland a basin. And uh, water storage has been increasing there. In the Murray Basin, uh, coming out of the millennial drought, so in response uh, to the drought. Um, the Yangtze Basin, uh, the uh, filling of the uh, Three Gorges uh, Reservoir, uh, the Ganges uh, Irrigation, and uh, the Indus and Brahmaputra similarly. And the Euphrates uh, drought in the middle 2000s and um, irrigation. Um, so overall, uh, the net water storage uh, uh, change um, over this time period has been positive, and uh, Matt Rodell uh, wrote about that uh, uh, contributing negatively to uh, sea level change. I'm not going to talk about that today. So this is the, the results from the University of Texas Center for Space Research MassCon solution. Uh, so now comparing um, these uh, data uh, with uh, the model results. 
So on the uh, left here, you can see uh, the gray are the three different uh, gray s solutions, and uh, the blue are the global hydrologic models, water gap, and uh, PCR, and the others then are the land surface models. And this is for the Mississippi Basin. So you can see for the Mississippi, we have variability among the gray solutions. Um, and then uh, also uh, variability among the hydrologic models. Both of these are forced with the same precipitation. And then a lot of variability among the uh, land surface models. Um, CLM is the only one, CLM4 is the only one that shows an increase in storage similar uh, to uh, GRACE. Um, I would add that uh, the water gap model is calibrated to mean annual runoff and, uh, um, but, uh, and is the only model that is uh, calibrated. So the Amazon is uh, where I think GRACE shows its strength, 6 million square kilometer area, and so this is a large scale area, and you can see um, good consistency among the GRACE solutions. Um, the um, global hydrologic models, you know, uh, water gap is showing a slight increase, but PCR showing a large decrease in storage. And uh, we they ran that model several times, checking different things, but uh, in the end um, showed a large decrease in storage. And then the land surface models, some of them close to zero change and some large decreases um, in storage. Uh, so a lot of variability. So large scale basins are not necessarily the forte of, of um, uh, models. Looking at uh, the Okavanga and Zambezi uh, region where water storage has been increasing internally drained basins and um, fairly good consistency among gray solutions, uh, but most of the models uh, simulate runoff, it um, moves off out of the system, so they cannot simulate these endoraic uh, basins or internally uh, drained basins, so they show very low changes in water storage. Um, the high basin in uh, northeast uh, China, where there's a lot of human uh, water use for irrigation, uh, the gray state is showing a decrease in storage. And this is uh, one of the few cases where we see that the hydrologic models overestimate uh, the decline in storage, uh, both water gap and uh, PCR, both of which include human intervention. And the land surface models do not simulate human water use, so they simulate uh, close to zero storage change uh, in this basin. And the Ganges then decline in storage, uh, mostly related to irrigation and uh, variability among the different models. Um, regardless of whether they have uh, human water use or not. So you can see uh, that uh, um, in many cases, uh, the uh, models underestimate the changes in storage uh, from GRACE, and uh, sometimes, uh, like the Amazon, simulate the opposite uh, trend. Um, so if we want to look at uh, the uh, maps of um, uh, for these different models, looking at uh, on the bottom here, I'm showing the GRACE data from uh, CSR. And on the upper left, this is the uh, water gap global hydrologic model. And uh, you can see that the colors for the different basins are fairly similar between water gap and uh, GRACE, uh, but the intensity is uh, less. And so, for example, the Amazon uh, grace is um, 43, uh, depletion of 43 cubic kilometers per year, and the water gap shows about 11 uh, cubic kilometers per year. Uh, similarly, uh, the uh, decline in storage uh, in the Ganges, uh, water gap underestimates uh, the decline in storage relative to grace. Um, so uh, similar trends, but generally um, the amplitudes are lower. And so here is the um, PCR, uh, global hydrologic model. And the biggest uh, uh, difference here is the Amazon with a large decline in storage uh, of about minus 67 cubic kilometers per year. Um, 
and then um, you know much lower changes in storage or opposite trends uh, in uh, different regions relative uh, to grace and large differences between WGHM and PCR. And before we did this analysis, uh, the modelers in these two different groups uh, never uh, really compared the results of their uh, models and so weren't uh, uh, really aware of uh, the, the differences. Um, so the um, comparing the uh, NOAA 3.3 land surface model with GRACE, um, what do you think uh, this looks like? Opposite, yes, a lot of red. Um, so um, uh, declines in storage in many areas. Um, um, you know, you can see Africa. You know, declines in storage um, from uh, NOAA uh, relative to Grace and also the Amazon. And and this is uh, CLM four. Um, again, you know, declines in storage uh, in uh, South America relative to Grace. A um, little bit better in some of the African basins, maybe declines in storage, not picking up the recovery in the Murray uh, Basin. And then increases in storage uh, in the Ganges, but it does not include um, irrigation. So that may be um, some of the reasons of the increases in storage in the um, Ganges Basin and neighboring basins. So to summarize, uh, the models uh, tend to underestimate uh, both the rises in water storage during wet periods and the declines in water storage uh, during dry periods. Um, so they're underestimating these extremes for the most part. The high basin was the only basin where we saw the, uh, I mean, one of the few basins where we saw the global hydrologic models overestimating the decline. Um, so if we're using these models going forward, then we may be underestimating the impacts of climate extremes uh, in the future. Um, and looking at uh, the uh, time series uh, then, where, you know, GRACE measures total water storage uh, from the uh, land surface uh, deep to the deep subsurface, but where is the storage uh, changing? And uh, so in this Euphrates Basin, uh, there was a large drought in the mid-2000s, and this is the cumulative precipitation anomaly, and so you can see a large decline in cumulative precipitation in this time uh, reflecting the drought. Uh, but the models, um, you know, start off low and, and don't simulate the, the, the range that we see uh, from the GRACE data. And this is the uncertainty in the GRACE uh, data. Um, so um, Jay and uh, his uh, student, Caitlin Voss, uh, were one of the first people to evaluate uh, this and um, emphasize uh, the impact of the drought on water storage and attributed uh, most of the change to um, groundwater pumpage and uh, irrigation. Um, another study, uh, Laurent Longvern and others, attributed uh, most of the change uh, to uh, surface reservoir storage declines because there are a lot of surface reservoirs in that region. And uh, so uh, when he did his analysis, he um, related it to that. And another study later attributed the decline to surface reservoirs and uh, mostly natural groundwater depletion, but not irrigation depletion. So there's a lot of um, uh, uh, uncertainty in attributing the storage changes to a certain component. And uh, one of the problems with these regions is that there's very limited uh, ground-based data uh, to constrain uh, those uncertainties. And uh, with time, as people try to get their hands on more local data and stuff, can try to um, uh, improve that analysis. So if we look at the time series then in these uh, different basins, and this is the uh, Ganges, and the black line is um, grace, and uh, the gray uh, around it then is uh, uh, the black line uh, uh, is uh, the uncertainty in the grace uh, data, and CSR mass cons is uh, the, the black line. And uh, you can see 
these different models, they start off low, uh, lower than the grace, and then they um, increase uh, in storage uh, in, in many of these uh, models uh, during the later time period. Um, so this gives you an idea of what happens over time. And we see similar things uh, for the Indus Basin on the west and uh, the uh, Brahmaputra in the east. You know, underestimation of groundwater de depletion, uh, even in the hydrologic models that include uh, human water use. Uh, if we look at uh, the Arkansas Basin, uh, you know, pretty good uh, up to this uh, period, but then again, towards the end, then underestimating uh, groundwater de decline in uh, the uh, latter period. Um, this is the high basin. So this is um, um, these dashed lines are the hydrologic models, PCR and WGHM. So this is the one of the few basins uh, where they're overestimating the decline in water storage. And the land surface models are relatively flat because they don't inclu include human intervention. Uh, the Euphrates that we just looked at, you know, decline in storage related uh, to the drought. So looking at uh, the uh, rising water storage in the Amazon, then we see, you know, many models underestimating uh, the rise in storage towards the latter period and some estimating large declines in storage. Uh, the, um, that's the Missouri, um, you know, not uh, a large increase in storage in 2011 flooding and uh, the models underestimating uh, that. And then in the Okavanga, the models are pretty flat because when they get runoff, it just runs out of the model and they're not um, simulating the increase in storage in these endorheic basins and uh, do a fairly good job of the uh, drought recovery in the Murray uh, Basin, but not uh, quite getting the amplitude. So th this gives you an idea of uh, the um, time series in water storage. So if we um, rank the uh, water storage changes in the basins uh, from declining storage with the uh, Ganges having the largest decline in water storage to the rises in water storage with the Amazon, and I'm not even getting up to the 40 cubic kilometers per year that we see in the Amazon. And this is the uh, variability in the GRACE data among the different solutions. Uh, so you can see decreasing trends here and uh, rising uh, trends here. Um, and the, these are uh, the uh, hydrologic models. And you can see in most of these basins, so 180 basins, uh, in most of the models underestimate the declines in water storage um, in this uh, region. And also uh, where we see rising trends, some of that could be recovery from drought or uh, recent climate trends. Uh, but most of the models showing uh, not quite capturing some overestimating the rise, but most uh, uh, estimating a decline or not uh, getting uh, the um, rising trends. And these are the land surface models again. Um, um, some decline in water storage, but generally underestimating here and uh, very much underestimating uh, the rise in water storage in uh, these uh, basins. And uh, we see that uh, the declining uh, storage uh, is uh, mostly related uh, to irrigation. Here we show the percentage of the basin that is irrigated, and uh, the blue is irrigated uh, by uh, groundwater and uh, the green by surface water. And over here where we see rising trends, there's really not that much uh, irrigation going on in these basins. So what could be some of the uh, causes for the discrepancies uh, between the models and GRACE and also variations among the models? So I think uh, in the land surface models, they're missing the surface water storage and the groundwater storage. Um, but um, Sean Swenson, in some of his modeling with the CLM model, you know, said that he can uh, simulate uh, the uh, subsurface storage uh, with just soil moisture storage if he varies the thickness of the soil layer up to eight meters. So it may be difficult. Uh, so maybe with the two meter storage in many of the models for soil moisture, some are four meter thick, they may not have enough storage capacity to uh, show the ranges in storage from wet to dry periods. 
Um, and uh, this is with the most of the models. Uh, and then for the Amazon, maybe some of the reason for a poor job there may be overbank storage and flooding, and most of the models don't simulate that, so storage changes related to that. Um, only WGGM and PCR had similar forcing. Most of the other models had different forcing, so some of the variations may be due to variations in precipitation forcing. Um, however, when we tested that in some of the models uh, by making the forcing the same, we didn't find that was a big factor in the testing that we did, the limited testing. And then uh, model calibration, only WGHM model is calibrated to average annual discharge, river discharge, and none of the other models are calibrated. So I know talking to some of these modelers that, uh, for example, Yoshi Wada, when he applies uh, these global models now at more regional scales, he does a calibration at those scales and modifies the parameters and stuff. So. On the one hand, you know, you have a kind of a crude, uh, simplified uh, representation of the hydrology with these large scale models. And on the other hand, you have the regional models, for example, that the US Geological Survey develops uh, for many aquifers in the US. It takes them years, uh, Department of Water Resources. Uh, and so uh, it's the two ranges, you know, and so um, maybe we need. Uh, maybe we need to move from modeling to machine learning. <laughs> uh, but it can be quite uh, arduous. Um, so now I would like to talk a little bit about um, the Colorado River Basin and uh, the regional scale modeling. So um, Lenny Conoco did a very nice uh, job of summarizing the USGS regional models um, that uh, they conducted over decades and what the total uh, uh, from the groundwater storage uh, trends were in these aquifers from uh, 1900 through 2008. Uh, so you can see uh, the Central Valley, 145 uh, cubic kilometers over this period. The High Plains is uh, all is shown in red, and uh, this yellow is a different aquifer, 340 uh, cubic kilometers decline over this period. And most of it would be from 1950s, really, even though he's showing from 1900. Uh, the Mississippi Basin, another very heavily irrigated basin, 180 uh, cubic kilometers, and uh, the uh, lower Colorado basin, uh, 102 cubic kilometers. So, uh, and uh, positive uh, changes in sto storage or negative depletion uh, in the Snake um, aquifer, river aquifer, um, and uh, the uh, Columbia Plateau. Um, and uh, why do you think that might be? Glacier input. Disappeared on that area already in the case of the Alps. Many glacier but disappearing. Right, but the storage is increasing. Comes from somewhere else and it goes there. Right. So where would you pump it? Where would you change flux to storage then? Surface water irrigation. Uh, so it's predominantly surface water irrigation in those areas. So it really shows, I mean, there is groundwater irrigation, uh, but it shows the importance of conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater and uh, trying to have more sustainable uh, water resource management. So if we look at uh, the period from 2000 to, to 2008 then, um, what do you think are the big differences between the entire record and what's happening in um, more recent when it's more of an overlap period with grace? Yes. Yes. So the lower Colorado changed from 100, and 100 cubic kilometers uh, over the, the long term, but uh, a positive change in storage uh, over that um, recent uh, period. Any, any ideas on what uh, happen was happening there? Again, you know, large, uh, 
originally uh, heavily dependent on groundwater. Uh, then they were allowed to, to uh, transfer water from the Colorado River and uh, flood irrigation with uh, surface water and to manage aquifer recharge. Um, uh, help to uh, change it around because they had large scale subsidence from groundwater pumpage and uh, active management areas. So you can see the entire high plains is shown in red and um, um, but um, uh, really the Nebraska portion in the northern high plains uh, the uh, GRACE data showed that the, the storage is actually increasing and uh, so it's uh, and even the regional models show that and so most people uh, group the high plains as one system but uh, it's really the Nebraska area is quite different because they have surface water irrigation they have the Nebraska sand hills which is uh, where there's a lot of recharge uh, and it's quite different from the central and southern high plains. So if we look at uh, the uh, Colorado Basin then and uh, uh, Stephanie Castle, one of Jay's students, did some the earliest work in this uh, region and uh, looking at um, uh, water storage depletion um, in the Colorado Basin and attributed most of it uh, to uh, groundwater um, use uh, for irrigation. And um, uh, then we uh, did another analysis of that, and, and this is what I will show now, uh, looking at uh, uh, more um, different types of data, ground-based gravity, groundwater level data, and other uh, data types, and that's what I will show uh, now. So um, the Colorado, our main findings were that, you know, we w extended the analysis back to 1980 using models and the Colorado Basin has been subjected to several droughts over the past few decades and um, with total water storage, model total water storage declining by about 100 cubic kilometers in, in a drought from 86 to 90. Um, a drought in California over a similar time period, uh, 87 to 92, and uh, in 1998 to around the year 2000, there was another drought with a similar depletion. And uh, more recent drought than a 50 cubic kilometer uh, decline in storage. Some people um, uh, term it a mega drought in the Colorado Basin uh, over the last uh, uh, almost uh, 20 years. Um, and in the upper Colorado Basin, it seems that most of the storage decline is related to reservoir storage and soil moisture storage because there's not that much irrigation. But in the lower basin, it's uh, surface reservoir storage decline, soil moisture, and groundwater depletion. And... Um, and most people, you know, when you ask them about uh, the uh, Colorado Basin and what's going on, they say increasing uh, water demand. You know, this is like, you know, uh, uh, the general consensus. Uh, but uh, really, it's uh, variations in supply in response to climate that I think is a bigger factor than uh, variations in water demand. So the um, this is uh, the... Uh, uh, Colorado Basin. Uh, this is the lower Colorado Basin, which generally corresponds to the state of Arizona. And this is the upper Colorado Basin, large basin, 660,000 square kilometers, and provides water to about 40 million people. Many of these uh, people are outside the basin, and many of them are in um, uh, California. And irrigation for about uh, 20,000 uh, square kilometer area. The upper basin generates most of the runoff from uh, snowmelt, 80% uh, of the stream flow, and uh, the store reservoir storage capacity is about um, close to 90 cubic kilometers, corresponding to about a couple of years of flow in the river. So if we uh, look at uh, water storage changes, it reflects the balance of inputs relative to outputs, uh, our water supply versus demand. So if we have declining storage, it could be that the supply is declining, the demand is increasing, or both. Um, and uh, so we need uh, to look at the water balance of the different compartments. And then um, it's important to understand that uh, the variations in the inputs and outputs could be a result of natural variations in response to climate or uh, human intervention. So here I show the uh, um, 
water budget for the uh, upper basin from 1980 to 2014 and uh, you know precipitation so moisture groundwater so very little groundwater withdrawal in the upper basin most of the upper basin uh, irrigation is based on surface water and then uh, discharge from this basin then to the lower Colorado basin um, and here you can see in the uh, lower basin then, um, you know, pretty much 50, almost 50-50 surface water and groundwater uh, use in the lower basin, uh, mostly uh, for irrigation. Uh, so the um, Bureau of Reclamation has looked at uh, water demand in the basin for the different sectors and includes evaporation exports from the basin and irrigation being the dominant one and these different um, sectors and so you can see you know may increase in uh, demand uh, up through about uh, the the late 80s but then it's just been bopping up and down and no real trend after that time period um, the lower basin um, a much uh, bigger demand uh, you know, relative to the upper basin. And uh, again, it looks, uh, you've got interannual variability, but it looks very flat. We've g only got data through 2005 and they still haven't finalized uh, the uh, recent data, um, but they're working on it. So looking at uh, the uh, water storage uh, anomalies, uh, so this is total water storage and uh, going back in time based on modeling, you can see that we've had uh, uh, large droughts and total water storage declining in the, uh, and I'm only going to talk about the lower basin now. So the red is the uh, GRACE data, and uh, this is the um, total water storage over the, this uh, time period, the recent time period, and we've had large scale droughts in the past. And the problem is that uh, the recovery from these droughts is generally less than, and we haven't had uh, much recovery uh, in the last, um, you know, since the uh, late 90s. Uh, so basically, uh, mega drought type of uh, conditions. And then this is the um, different component storages. This is the surface reservoir storage. And... Um, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, these are the largest reservoirs in the U.S. Um, and then this is soil moisture storage, uh, changes in response to drought, and uh, then uh, groundwater storage uh, changes uh, different time periods. And these are the uh, wet periods and these are the drought periods. So around 1990, around 2000, dry periods, and then recently. So pretty much uh, dry, and this is precipitation, and uh, this is uh, runoff uh, data from the USGS Water Watch. So very long-term dry conditions, except for a short uh, period around 2005. So these are the uh, groundwater level data in the upper basin, and you can see these are the hydrographs. So you can see in many cases the groundwater levels are fairly flat, and uh, um, this is consistent with little use of groundwater for irrigation. Uh, and in the uh, lower basin, then, these are the hydrographs, a couple of thousand hydrographs. And these regions, this is the area of Phoenix, and this is an active management area because they had a lot of subsidence. And this is Tucson, and uh, Pinal is another active management area. And uh, so um, this is uh, groundwater storage in the, uh, from groundwater level data in the lower basin. And uh, this is in the minimally developed areas outside of uh, the large cities and outside of irrigated areas. And uh, you can see that uh, that explains, and that's a misspelling in case. <laughs> the uh, minimally developed areas explain most of the variation in uh, groundwater uh, storage. Um, and so basically the groundwater is responding to the climate variability to the wet and dry climate cycles and um, uh, there is, uh, and these are the active management areas and we see Phoenix, Pinal, Tucson, these cities and uh, the groundwater stores sort of 
uh, gradually increasing. And these are areas, the green is a basin where they don't have any access to surface water. So uh, groundwater storage is declining a lot in that basin and in a couple of other basins without, uh, where they don't have access to the Colorado River water. Uh, so this is the number of wells that were used, you know, up to a couple of thousand uh, wells to look at uh, the composite hydrograph uh, in the lower basin. So if you look, so this is California, uh, this is um, Arizona, which uh, basically is the lower basin, this is Nevada, and so you can see the Colorado River. This is the Central Arizona project, and it brings surface water from uh, the Colorado then to these active management areas, Phoenix, Pinal, and uh, Tucson. And uh, so they've used that then for surface water irrigation. So flood irrigation with surface water is sort of like managed aquifer recharge. Although people who work in managed aquifer recharge emphasize it's intentional, you know. Uh, but I mean, the aquifer doesn't realize whether the human has intended it to get there or not. And it still gets down to the aquifer. So flood irrigation, and it's about 30% inefficient. So it really has played a big role in recharging the aquifers. And, and we're actually sort of moving more towards that now with the California and flood MAR, they call it flood managed aquifer recharge, where they irrigate, uh, put the water out into the irrigation canals in the winter uh, to irrigate uh, the, um, um, you know, vineyards and uh, almond orchards uh, to recharge the aquifer. And so inefficient surface water is uh, just, uh, to me, like managed aquifer recharge. Uh, but then they do have, um, uh, also have ma uh, managed aquifer recharge sites where they just pond water uh, for recharge. So here you can see uh, in closer view the uh, active management areas uh, and uh, the uh, cap water um, moving into these basins. Um, so these are uh, spreading basins where they um, um, put water in these to recharge. And, and the sediments are pretty coarse grained. And so it gets down into the aquifers. And this is another uh, region here. Uh, so uh, in these active management areas, the green areas are where they don't have any access to surface water. Um, and so these rely totally on groundwater. So looking at the um, hydrographs, the composite hydrographs then in these regions, so you can see increases in water storage in the active management areas, particularly in the late um, in the, in the nine around 1990, this was a very wet period, so it wasn't really um, managed aquifer recharge or f or the surface water irrigation. But then you know it's uh, it stayed fairly stable or slightly increased um, because of uh, the uh, surface water input. And um, these are the basins then uh, where they don't have access to surface water, and it's still uh, declining a lot in those basins. So Don Poole has done ground-based gravity um, in this uh, region. And uh, this is a network uh, of um, monitoring that he had there. And again, ground-based gravity measures total storage from the land surface to the deep aquifers. And so you would need to disaggregate that also. But he's got groundwater level data and uh, gravity data. And he can estimate how much change in groundwater storage from the gravity. So this is what he sees in the active management areas. So increases in s gravity um, and storage in these active management areas uh, from uh, irrigation and managed aquifer recharge. So the implications of this analysis so the global models may be underestimating water storage trends uh, relative to GRACE data. And these storage trends are from climate variability and human water use, mostly irrigated agriculture. And um, 
it's important to, to understand what are the controls on water storage trends if we want to manage them. So if humans are over pumping, then we need, they need to ratchet back the pumping. If it's responding to climate variability and not a, uh, reflecting human pumpage, then we need to adapt to this climate variability and store more water from the wet periods for use during droughts through managed aquifer recharge or surface irrigation or other approaches. Um, and I think it's important to combine modeling and remote sensing and ground-based monitoring. And basically, you need to look at everything to constrain your uncertainties. Um, and um, I, uh, as the Colorado shows, you need to um, address um, hot spots of uh, water depletion uh, by storing water from wet periods uh, for use during dry periods in these depleted aquifers. And so we're looking at that in Texas now because we've had a lot of flooding in the last couple of years. And uh, Chen Yang, uh, my collaborator uh, in our group, has estimated that uh, we could capture, if we took the top 95th percentile of flow, um, we could uh, capture ab about the amount of water we use in the state uh, each year uh, and store it in these depleted aquifers. And uh, Stephanie Coaches and others in UC Davis have done similar analysis in California showing how much water they could capture uh, from excess uh, surface water. And uh, we also consider in-stream flows and other things. So, um, but uh, a lot of those people don't want to consider that there's any excess. And, and really, the um, in-stream flow people would like those high flows, pulse flows, uh, for sediment distribution, for channel um, um, development and stuff. So uh, that's go we're going to be working more and more on that aspect. And in Idaho, they move about a half a cubic kilometer, up to half a cubic kilometer from the Snake River uh, to the Eastern Snake Plains Aquifer uh, uh, each year. And they've got the irrigation canal structure to do that, um, to manage these extremes. So this is uh, some of our group from the Yapal Research Group that integrates uh, NASA and uh, USGS and academia. And uh, once in a blue moon, we're allowed to have some fun. <laughs> so thank you very much, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Bridget, for the very stimulating talk. So we have some time for questions. Okay. Okay, thanks for, for a great talk. So I have to say that you're, um, I'm usually the one that depresses people, but you know, your slides on the Colorado River Basin, I find it kind of depressing because of the long-term drought and the decline of the availability of water and you know, lots has been written on that. And so have you followed the, uh, like the drought contingency plan in the Colorado River Basin? And so, uh, just to let people know, so Colorado River Basin, whatever, seven basin states, and finally dealing with the over-allocation, and, and so there's cutbacks to the surface water availability in Arizona, sort of at the end of the line, and has to take a significant cut. And so what they've done, and then within Arizona, the farmers are at the end of the line. So farmers are basically being cut off from surface water and allowed to pump groundwater. Um, where do you see things going there? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, um, uh, so Pinal uh, Active Management Area, uh, so those farmers have decided that they want to um, um, go back to using groundwater because uh, with the reductions in surface water availability. So we will probably see groundwater level declines and, and uh, more subsidence uh, likely. and. I think maybe, I'm not sure if the state um, helps to fund uh, the development of the irrigation wells and... They're, they are, uh, yes, they are, exactly, right. Right. Yeah, so they're subsidizing, that's part of it, right? Right, yeah. So, you know, they, um, I think they tried to do what they could. I mean, they had to get permission from California to build the CAP, the Central Arizona Project, and uh, California has senior water rights, 
Um, and so they hadn't previously been taking their full allocation. And so uh, to use their full allocation, then they used managed aquifer recharge and, and they had the flood irrigation. So that helped the aquifers stop to the large scale decline and then stop to the subsidence. But now we may see um, that um, uh, starting up again. So, so the only comment I want to share with people, and you mentioned it before about the conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater. So I was at a meeting in Phoenix, ironically, where every time I go to a meeting in Phoenix, they're always celebrating how much groundwater they have and, and how they're open for business and welcome further development, um, which I always find a little bit, a little bit scary. Um, but, um, you know, I think, um, so oh, at this meeting, uh, the lawyers who who passed the who helped pass the drought contingency plan were so excited that they had passed this drought contingency plan. But you know it was all about the surface water and nothing about the groundwater. So it was clear that there was going to be a switch of those farmers in Arizona from surface water to groundwater, and sort of no discussion amongst mm -hmm. themselves that this was going to be a problem. So right. that's where we all have to get involved in terms of helping um you know in this case the lawyers who are writing this legislation to really understand that the net is not any better because the farmers are just going to use more groundwater and uh, you know we've seen these uh, transitions uh, uh, in different regions over time for example houston area with subsidence then they developed these subsidence districts and then they were not allowed to use groundwater and they had to switch to surface water so they have a lot of large reservoirs there and um, so that stopped the subsidence and then you know more groundwater use it's good when you have access to both surface water and groundwater like in the northwest when i was talking about the snake river plain and the columbia plateau but in the southern high plains central and southern high plains in kansas and texas there is no i mean we have playas which are a little bit like the the potholes here um but uh, it's uh, less than one percent of the area of the region there's just no surface water so uh, and in those places the recharge is very low much of the water was recharged thousands of years ago so we're just mining the water and then uh, when we um, use it up then we will have to revert to dry land to agriculture but where you have surface water and groundwater conjunctive use is critical and then you know whether you um, inefficient surface water irrigation flood irrigation and very efficient groundwater irrigation drip or something so i think that will help with more sustainable management okay we have time for one more question al So on the modeling side, it was interesting to see that none of the land surface models really do a good job with respect to at least simulating what Grace is showing, and Grace is probably reasonable. So why aren't, I mean, we've done this in Canada, but why aren't more people constraining the land surface models using Grace information? Because it would kind of help constrain the whole modeling paradigm and actually probably give you better solutions, because they're so far off. I mean, it's not even close. So any, do you know what, why people aren't constraining their land surface models with GRACE? Well, there have been some studies uh, with data simulation with GRACE, Ben Zeichik, uh, Jay Wright, and, uh, and others. So, so some studies are doing that. Uh, but they're also uh, trying to uh, bring in um, human intervention, irrigation. Uh, NASA's bringing in irrigation into their land surface models. and. Um, um, you know, so there are a lot of different efforts uh, going on, and, and Jay will probably be more. Uh, so we're talking about trends, and trends represents about less than 5% of uh, the signal. Most of the signal is seasonal or interannual, but that's what people oftentimes talk about. So the trends is a small part of the total signal, um, and so it's difficult uh, to capture also. So I just uh, I just wanted to ask you a follow up question. So this ending. I thought that was the last question. Yeah, no, but no, you know no, what? No. I, I I'm going to use my <laughs> MC right here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we've done a bit of work on that and constraining a land surface model at the regional scale. 
And yes, just expect that the regional scale, you can do a better job because typically you have more data, you have more computational resources, you're dealing with smaller scale. But again, we have a tendency of not looking at storage. So typically we mainly check for the stream flows and of course we did that, we'll show probably some of the results to you. And of course that constraining is very important. But my point is we are dealing with overly parameterized models with many parameters to constrain. And of course, you have a lot of degrees of freedom, much larger than the data available. Calibration, of course, helps, but of course, there is a risk of overfitting. So, and I, I wonder what, what's your vision on that? Because you showed the models are screwing up compared to grace. And also, you said something about machine learning, probably as a future avenue. I just wonder if you could elaborate on that as well. Well, I mean, uh, my basic MO is that we need to use everything. Uh, we need, uh, uh, and, but we shouldn't um, have such an emphasis on global modeling. You know, we should also emphasize regional modeling and what other groups uh, do. Uh, and then we need to uh, look at data analytics. We need to use machine learning. We need, to, we need to use all the tools we can access to try to better understand these systems. Right now with the Powell Research Group, Grace indicates that in the Mississippi Basin, there's very little change in water storage. The regional model says it's dropping off a cliff, you know. And so it's questioning then, maybe the regional model is wrong because um, maybe instead of uh, the uh, pumping coming from storage, it's capturing the surface water in the Mississippi Basin, the Mississippi. And so the USGS is doing a lot of detailed studies now with geophysics and everything to understand that groundwater surface water interaction, which was missing in their regional models. So I think it's great to have all these different data sources. We need a portfolio of approaches to look at these systems and try to understand the dynamics. We need to talk to the regional people who've been living with it. And you know, it's, it's just uh, pretty complicated. Um, and so we need to use everything. I don't know if that's very satisfactory, but that's the way I feel about it. That was a great answer. So uh, I think on that note, uh, we're gonna end it here. I'm mindful of time, but I'm sure there's a lot more interest to talk to you. So some announcements. So Bridget is gonna be with us until Friday. So if any of you have interest to meet her, she has a packed schedule, but we'll do our best to fit you in. So let me or Michelle know, and then we'll do our best. So please, yeah, give me, uh, so join me in thanking her for the great talk. Thank you for coming.